Please join me as we go to the Lord right now in prayer. Father, I thank you, God, for what you're doing here and the individuals. I know some of them, like Melissa, started us out. There could be some people right here right now that are angry with you, and we know that you can handle that. But Father God, we also know that you have this great and incredible ability to heal the brokenhearted, to heal those that are angry, to forgive. You taught us first how to do that. So Lord, as we have all of these people here that are within earshot, Father, that they surrender themselves to you and let you take over. Father, we thank you for this opportunity as we start a 21-day prayer and fasting time, Father God. So as we talk about that beginning today, that the people understand this is a fresh start. And we thank you, Lord, for that opportunity. You give us a fresh start every morning where we come alive. We thank you, Lord, as we get another opportunity to get closer to you, to receive your Son, Jesus Christ, and to let the, your presence in the Holy Spirit empower us. We thank you, Father, in the mighty and matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So the title today is Fresh Start. And the last two days were kind of unique for me. I, it's been a long time since I had two days this past Friday and Saturday that were very quiet. I really didn't have like things scheduled. I didn't have to go see anybody. There was my phone wasn't going off, no texts. And and I and like I normally do on Fridays, I tend to come up to the church. I come in here. And um, it was while I was in here I was just kind of not necessarily clear on what I was going to share today and just was listening, trying not to do a lot of talking. I was just listening to the Lord. Um, and then I'd kind of talk a little bit like, well, gosh, Lord, every time this year we do a three-week prayer and fasting because this isn't your calendar, but this is the world's calendar, and I want to trick the world to get on your calendar, and so we'll use it as a time to honor you and three-week prayer and fasting and It, it just kind of became clear to me that God was like, yeah, Adam, you don't have to do anything fancy. Just stick to the basics. Now, it may not appear or it may not occur to you, and I could understand why it may not, but it's really challenging for someone to come up every week and bring a message that might be fresh and challenging. I mean, I've, I've been doing this now for over 12 years, and... You know, that's, you know, and, and I try to get different people in here sometimes, but most of the time I'm the primary minister. And it gets challenging to come up with fresh things. And so sometimes when I get to a period like this, I feel like, well, I, I don't want to do that again. It seems so mundane, so routine. And God's like, Adam, prayer and fasting is something I directed everybody to do. So it became really easy to, for me to go, okay, I got it. I get it. I was just just wondering if things might have changed, but they really haven't, okay? And one of the reasons I, I get a little, maybe you can understand, is I get nervous that I want to make sure I'm pleasing God, okay? So um, it's just like God was comforting me and reminding me, Adam, it's okay. Share this about this so that people can have a fresh start. It's not going to be the same way they've done it in the past. And so, I mean, these are just things that we all need as his kids. He's telling me, don't, don't hesitate to share with my kids what they need to be fed. And so, with that being said, how is your prayer life? When, when do you pray? Now, come up with a little list here of some different types of prayer, so bear with me. I think one of the prayers we've probably all participated in, I'll call the 911 prayer. This is the prayer we make to God when we have an emergency, right? Because we've rationalized that we don't want to trouble God unless we have an emergency, okay? It's as if we've put God as this kind of, uh, like he, we've got a divine, he's, he's our divine spare tire, in other words. If, if one of area of our life goes flat. So we'll call on him then. That's what I call the 911 prayer. Then there's this prayer. The, I'll call the Jiminy Cricket prayer. 
When you wish upon a star Makes no difference who you are Anything your heart desires will come to you See, God is viewed like a cosmic grandfather, okay? Okay, now, don't forget this type of prayer. I call this one the Monty Hall prayer. It begins like this. God, let's make a deal. <laughs> right? I'll be in agreement with you, but first you've got to give me something. Okay? Then there's this one. I call it the Aladdin's Lamp prayer. This prayer is based upon the deep belief that if you just rub God the right way, he will magically be at your service. Right? It's, in other words, we treat God like a cosmic bellhop. Okay? Then there's this type of prayer. I call it the lottery prayer. This is the prayer that we claim, well, gosh, it can't hurt to try. By golly, I just might win. Right? And finally, there's this type of prayer. I call it the Guinness prayer. I call it the Guinness prayer because this is the one that's usually a very long worded prayer and sometimes even the loudest prayer. We're trying to set a record. There you go, you got it. Now seriously, we practice and teach fasting and praying as a lifestyle. Why? Simply because that's what scripture teaches us to do. Okay? Now, Fasting in our American culture of fast foods, of the McDonald's, of the Burger Kings, of the pizza places, of the ice cream places, it's not a popular topic. But let's look at what the Bible says about fasting. What are the values and the benefits of fasting? What happens? See, here's how we need What happens in the unseen realm when we fast and pray in the natural Many times in scripture, the call for fasting usually came during desperate times. Now, it led me to the book of Esther. I love the book of Esther. Now, what's unique about the book of Esther, if you're not aware, God's never mentioned in this entire book. It's the only book of the 66 books in the Bible where God is not even mentioned. But the theme of him runs rampant through it. Now, for instance, about fasting in the book of we, we read about prayer and, uh, prayer and fasting in this book because it was to provide for the well-being of the Jewish people. Now, the book is titled after the main character, Esther, Hadessa. She was an orphan, and she was adopted by her cousin, Mordecai. He belonged to the Jewish tribe of Benjamin. Now, Mordecai and Esther are some of these Jews that stayed back, stayed back in Babylon after... Nehemiah and all of them, Ezra, went back. Some of the Jews just stayed there. And so there's some of them. And now they've got this ruler from Persia, Xerxes, who's ruling over them. And um, they kind of took them into captivity. Now, Xerxes, we're introduced, he's this king, and he's, he's having a long party. It was like a hundred and some days of partying, celebrating. And he was drinking with the boys and partying a lot, and he wanted to show off, he wanted his wife, Vashti, to basically do a fashion show. And she said, uh-uh, not doing it. Right? So when she refused to do that, he dethroned her. Now, along came this idea, well, we need to find you a new queen. And this is where we're introduced to Esther. So they had all the young maidens come before the king, and he was going to pick one. And Esther's a Jew, but she kept her identity a secret, and she was picked by King Xerxes to be his new queen. Now, there's another character in this story. His name is Haman. And he's basically the prime minister. He's the second in command to King Xerxes. And he hates the Jews. He's from this lineage, if you remember back to King David's time, King Saul's time, the Amalekites. And he wants to destroy the Jews, mainly because he hates Mordecai, because one time everyone was supposed to bow down to him in the streets, and Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, so he was bound and determined to kill Mordecai. 
and he told the king, hey, if you make this decree, we'll wipe, we can wipe out this whole pipe of people, the Jews, okay? And so then Mordecai hears about this, and he applies to his, to, he adopted, basically, Esther, and he says, hey, I need to talk to you, because you've got to go to the king to make a case to the king to save our people. And Esther's kind of reluctant. She goes, wait, 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 wait. I, there's like a rule. If you go in front of the king unannounced, you can be killed. So I kind of don't want to do that. And I, was, I paid attention to what happened to the pre previous queen, and she didn't do what she was told, so I'm not really hesitant to do this, uh, cousin Mordecai. So here's what Mordecai sends to her. It's recorded in Esther, Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Follow along on the screen. He says to her, do not think that because you are the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. That's that famous line right there that we hear this. Like, don't you know, maybe you were put in this position for such a time as this. Right? Now, I, I imagine Esther probably thought she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Have you ever felt that way? Right? Like you'll say, like, how did I ever get myself in this situation? Well, Esther's in this situation, and she was challenged to take action by her cousin Mordecai, by a friend, okay? Someone who really cares about her. Her adopted father says to her, what in the world are you waiting for? Have you ever been like that? Like, what are you waiting for? You felt you needed to take action, but said to yourself, well, I'm... I'm going to get to that one of these days. Or you experience a broken relationship. And you've said, well, in due time, I'll get around to making things right. But you know what? The longer we put that off, the harder it gets. And then the easier it becomes for us to rationalize, I don't have to do it. Yeah, I was supposed to do that three years ago, but, you know, the time's passed. There's no point in it now. Mordecai's advice to Esther is good advice for each one of us. Now is the time. Seize the day. Seize the moment. Carpe diem. We all can find excuses to not take action. Or, gosh, let's just say, we can all find excuses not to change. We'll say, well, if I was in a better place, if this didn't happen to me, if I had a better job, yada, 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 just fill in the blanks. We can come up with all these excuses. If that would happen, then I'd be a better person. Folks, this is a great moment at the beginning of a new year to take action and make adjustments in our lives. Okay? And so in this story with Esther, she does the right thing, and here's the response she gives to Mordecai now in the next two verses. Esther 4, verses 16 and 17. She says to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Now here's the takeaway from this dialogue. Through the life of this woman, Esther, we are shown this pattern and thread that is woven throughout Scripture, folks. There, that spir Here it is. That spiritual power can come from God in an answer to prayer and fasting. Right? In other words, when God's people give themselves over to prayer and fasting, the miraculous is made possible. Now, it doesn't guarantee it, but it makes it possible according to Scripture. And at the end of three days, the king received Esther and granted her request and made a way for the Jewish people to be saved. Now, there's so much more going on there, but I don't want to get off on that right now. Haman was executed, and Mordecai was appointed to take his place as the new prime minister. Folks, that's just one example. I got a few other scriptures here where we can see, and it's, this is history, okay, where prayer and fasting made a difference. Remember Moses? Stood on the mountain before God, receiving the Ten Commandments. God called him to 40-day fast. Uh -huh. 
In Isaiah 58, you read this incredible discord from Isaiah, but really it's about this king who just died, Uzziah. He died after being the king for 52 years. And the, de the nation kind of was in this confusion and bewilderment. And then the prophet nation, uh, Isaiah tells this whole Isaiah 58 about the proper way to fast and pray. Then there's that story of the city of Nineveh and Jonah and the whale. Right? So the prophet finally, after getting spit out, spit out of the whale, comes to the city and basically tells them, God's going to destroy you. You better prepare for the coming judgment. You know what they did? The, ki the leader of that whole city, he said, we're going to pray and fast, and things changed for them. Right? King Jehoshaphat, he was surrounded by his enemies, and he proclaimed a prayer and fast for all of Judah. Through fasting and prayer, God gave Jehoshaphat victory. Nehemiah, he was the guy that built that wall as they returned to Jerusalem. Well, he was used mightily by the Lord for that, and he had been praying and fasting. These scriptures, and there's so many others, suggest several reasons that prayer and fasting are necessary, such as when we do this, it strengthens our prayer life. Okay? It helps us to seek God's guidance instead of our self's guidance. We, we seek deliverance and protection. We express repentance and a return to God more easily. We tend to be more humble to the Lord. We tend to express more concern for doing the true religion, which is serving widows and orphans and then just being a servant. Right? We tend to just minister to others a lot easily, a lot more easily. It's, it, we tend to overcome temptation and dedicate ourselves to the God easier than we ever did before. And you know what else we do? We express love and worship to God more thoroughly. Right? In other words, there's a relation between this physical act of obedience that in a spiritual sense releases God's favor and God's blessings. See, prayer and fasting is one example of this physical act of obedience and a spiritual phenomenon of God's blessings manifest. We have to do a physical act, okay? Another type of this physical kind of obedience that brings spiritual blessings is when, that example in Exodus 17, when Moses' hands were raised, right, in obedience as they were battling the Amalekites. The Bible says when Moses' hands were raised to the heavens, Joshua and the Hebrews were advancing and defeating the Amalekites. But if Moses' hands came down, they were, it's like the angels were backing off and retreating. This is a wonderful physical act of support for the shepherd where Aaron and her were helping Pastor Moses keep his hands up so that they could win the victory. Right? In the unseen realm, there are these angels that are, that are attacking the Amalekite when Moses' hands are up. And when Moses' hands would fall, it's like the angels were backing off and retreating. Now, why do I say that? Well, in the book of Hebrews, in fact, in chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews, it says that angels are sent out on behalf of those who inherit salvation. Well, that's you and I if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. All right? It also says that these angels are sent out as spirits ministering flames of fire. Okay? Right? So in the unseen realm, God is releasing these angelic ministering spirits when we have a corresponding physical act of obedience in the natural. Now, so, so you've got to understand, if you do a physical act of obedience... You're not going to see it in the natural, but it's going to happen in the spiritual. And you know what happens when all those things go? To God be the glory. Amen. See, that's whatever that outcome, you're going to go, wow, I can't figure it out, but to God be the glory. Now, from a biblical perspective, fasting is not a diet. All right? Fasting is not primarily for physical reasons. It's for spiritual reasons. Fasting is not a work to merit God's favor. Fasting is a step of obedience. Fasting does not get from God what he is reluctant to give us. Fasting is not a way to punish ourselves for our sins and earn God's forgiveness. See, when we fast, 
We forsake physical pleasure to better focus on the spiritual things of God. When we fast, we acknowledge Christ's lordship in our lives. See, when we fast, we are seeking God's will. Remember the, the Lord's Prayer? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? When we fast, we are thanking God for his presence. When we fast and pray, we have the assurance that God does hear and answer our prayers. Now, the answer may be yes immediately, it may be yes down the road, and it may be no, and here's a better plan. Okay? Now, I hope this is kind of starting to sink in and make sense. Here, here's another little short story I have. There was this five-year-old boy, let's call him Johnny, and he was an only child. And he wanted a baby brother, right? And he's been talking to his dad, and he goes, Dad, I want a baby brother. How can I help? Now, the father goes, this is a great opportunity to teach young Johnny about prayer, the importance of prayer. And because Johnny had heard there was this talk going around the house about this little bundle that's going to be arriving. Okay? And the father goes, I tell you what, Johnny, if you start praying that God will give you a baby brother, baby brother, I guarantee you in two months you're going to have a baby brother. Okay? Now, obviously, Dad knew something that Johnny didn't know. But Johnny, five-year-old Johnny, accepted the challenge, and that very evening began prayer, praying to the Lord in his, his bedroom, wanting a baby brother. Now, Johnny continued praying for one month, and Johnny, being a five-year-old, you know, going around the neighborhood telling everybody, but Johnny, listening to the other people in the neighborhood, started to be realizing that, wait, babies don't show up in two months. No baby in the history of the world has ever shown up in two months. So Johnny stopped praying after one month. You know? Now, at the end of two months, Johnny's mother went to the hospital. When she came home, the parents called Johnny to the bedroom to surprise Johnny with, a, with an answer to his prayer. Johnny went into the bedroom, not expecting to see anything, but there, right next to Mommy was this little bundle of joy, a little brother. And then Dad pulled back the covers, and there was another boy. So they had twin boys. Johnny's dad looks at him and said, Now aren't you glad you prayed, son? Johnny looked back at Dad and said, Yes, but aren't you glad I quit? So, what really are the spiritual reasons to fast? Well, if we're Christians, Jesus expects us to fast. Here's just a couple of examples. Jesus didn't say, if you fast. He said, when you fast. Matthew chapter 6, 16 and 18. Moreover, when you fast, this is Jesus speaking, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, let me just give you a context. We're starting tonight at sundown. You're likely going to have a headache tomorrow. When that happens, the challenge is going to be, what's wrong with you you know, whoever, someone's talking to you. Please don't go, I'm fasting! <laughs> because according to Jesus, you have your reward. I'm just reminding us. I mean, because that happens to all of us. Trust me. That, that, that's, that, that temptation is there. <laughs> right? But Jesus says, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so it's okay to take a shower. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right? So that you do not appear to be fasting, to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in a secret place, you'll see, and your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Well, hallelujah. Some stuff's going to happen that aren't going to be hidden. I can't wait to hear the testimonies. Right? Or look at Luke chapter 5. Verses 33 and 35, a whole diff that was the Beatitudes Jesus was talking there in Matthew. Here's a whole different encounter. These guys said to Jesus, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees? But yours eat and drink. 
And Jesus said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. That's right now. Then they will fast in those days. We're in those days. Okay? There's another time Jesus is talking to people and they're trying to... Re this person's got a demon. And Jesus goes, this kind of demon only comes out with prayer and fasting. So I'm telling you. That's three examples Jesus is talking about to encourage us to pray and fast. So if you came in, you're going, oh, do we have to? Well, there it is. Okay? And, and see, fasting, again, is if you want to improve your spiritual journey, this is why we do this. We, we fast to delay gratification of physical desires to enhance our spiritual desires. And, and folks, it's okay, but this doesn't come naturally to us. So it's okay if, you, if, if this is kind of uncomfortable. And it's not easy, just like nothing's easy at first. But if we will just take that step and begin it, it becomes a part of how we live. Fasting, if you look at it, it's kind of like cleaning out the hard drive of your computer. Okay? Right? You just got to every so often clean it up for, for stuff. Junk gets in there. Viruses. Right? It, it enhances the functioning of the computer. Or think of it, it's like when you change the oil in a car. Okay? Prayer and fasting is necessary to get our lives in proper order and receive spiritual breakthroughs. Right? Prayer and fasting helps us to clarify and focus our attention on spiritual goals instead of natural goals. I mean, you know, there's just going to be a lot of things we want to do. Like, you know, people are going to put a... And, I, and I, I think this time of year is good to make, you know, New Year's resolutions. I think those are great. But I hope some of your resolutions are going to be spiritual resolutions and not only physical resolutions. Okay? And, and if you make these things a law, I guarantee you, you're not going to be doing them in a month to six weeks. Because the first time you meet them, you're going to beat yourself up, and then you're going to go, well, I failed at it, so I'll quit. And then you'll be in that same routine. Come on, in this calendar year, let's do something different. Okay? See, the purpose of prayer and fasting is to humble ourselves before God in such a way that we get in a right relationship with Him and with other people. We need to remember that it's more important to fast from sin than to fast from food. <laughs> I, I don't think a lot of, I mean, I think people get real wrapped up in it. I'm not going to eat this and this and this and pat themselves on the back, yet they're still doing the same sin they've been doing. You fast from sin. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Right? Right? See, during times of fasting, we have to reflect on the important things in life. But because, folks, our time is precious. We don't want to waste it. The, the time you have with your loved ones is too precious to waste constantly arguing and complaining and bickering about non-essentials. Right? We need to be doing everything we can to live in harmony with our family and our loved ones. Prayer and fasting, folks, assists us in making good memories. During this prayer and fasting time, ask God to examine your heart and show you how you can do a better job at encouraging your relationships. Don't make it complicated. I'm, I guarantee you, ask God, if you have a hard time saying sorry, if you had, have a hard time forgiving, ask God, help me during this prayer and fasting time, and I believe you will come out different on the other end of this three weeks. Right? Look at ways to build people up instead of tearing them down. Right? Prayer and fasting will help us to remember it's not what happens to us, but rather how we respond. That's the deal. Right? Every day, folks, we're going to face challenges that are unpleasant. That's life. If you think you're having a bad life because you have unpleasant things, no, that's life. It's not a bad life. It's life. That's one of the things this culture is so messed up on. Everybody is just this... You know, these just snowflake type people that just think they can have whatever they want without doing anything. And they say, well, they have it better than me. No, they don't. They just know how to respond differently than you. They know how to overcome. They don't quit. They get back up and get back at it. Mm. Now, let's be reminded of the many benefits to, to fasting that the Bible says. Fasting intensifies our desire to pray. Fasting deepens our humility. Fasting helps us cultivate an attitude of humility. Fasting encourages perseverance in prayer. Like maybe, oh, I'm having a hard time. If you fast, you'll be drawn to pray. 
Fasting increases our delight in God's answers. Fasting intensifies our concentration on prayers. Fasting amplifies faith. Oh, now, now, now catch that correlation, right? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and it's impossible to please God without faith. So how about, here it is, as we begin this, that we understand that if you really embrace this fasting and praying time, you're going to increase your faith life. Hallelujah. Fasting creates a new openness to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Fasting defeats the power of the enemy and gives spiritual victory. So if you haven't figured it out yet, the primary purpose for prayer and fast is to draw closer to the Lord, to enhance our God encounter. Everything that we do here, right, we say, we want you to encounter God. God's word does, does not, like, you know, we've, we've seen Jesus say this stuff. And, and I want to tell you, God kind of says, this is what you should do. But the scriptures teach us that fasting is a freedom to be enjoyed by serious seekers after righteousness. He's not going to make you do this. He tells us to do it, but he, there's a lot of things he tells us to do that we don't do. Here we are again, corporately, we're, we're claiming as a body that we're going to prayer and fast. Remember that Moses fasted 40 days and nights on Mount Sinai. Elijah fasted at Mount Horeb. Jesus fasted in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights while being tempted. Right? In each instance, these fasts were tied into a mighty work of God affecting both those individuals and the nation. So, here we are. This 21 days of prayer and fasting. There are several reasons to focus our prayers on certain things here. I want you to do this. Pray that God's will will be done and that you'll have peace with that. That you'll have peace with God's will being done. I want you to pray for your families. I want you to pray for your pastor and the ministry. Okay? Pray for people here at Freedom Destiny. Specifically, name them and pray for them. Pray for people in this community to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Pray for missionaries serving around the world. Pray for world evangelism. Right? Just like this send opportunity we have coming in February. But you can start doing that now. Pray for your own spiritual maturity. Then pray for your church's spiritual maturity. And then pray for the community's spiritual maturity. Then pray for the nation's spiritual maturity. Okay? The scriptures strongly encourage specific times of prayer and fasting. So every year at this time, we begin our corporate 21 day of prayer and fasting. And we culminate that at the 21st day of a big feast and we bring a special offering too. Okay? Tonight at sundown, we begin this. And then at the end of the church service on the 20, three weeks from today, at the end of when I get done speaking on the 27th, we're going to have a big feast. We're going to bring a special offering, and we're going to celebrate, okay? See, and we bring, we bring food. We, we bring covered dishes of food. We bring side dishes, main dishes. We bring desserts. I like desserts. Hallelujah. I'm going to be fasting some of those, though. But we bring, and we want to have a family feast. And there are a number of different fasts you can choose from to consider during this 21 days. You can fast all food and have only drink. You know, liquid diet. You can skip a meal or just have one meal a day. You can abstain from certain kinds. Be specific about certain foods you want to stay away from. Maybe some sweets or desserts. Maybe certain drinks. Maybe sodas, coffee, those kinds of things. And it's very normal, again, I said this earlier, that you may encounter a headache during this time at the start. Just at the start. You know what's going on? Your body's getting rid of all the impurities in, inside. That's why, the toxins, and it's really healthy for us. That's why we want to make this a lifestyle, okay? Now, a fast has to be abstaining from some kind of food or drink, okay? But in addition to that, I encourage you to fast things like maybe TV, social media, Facebook, Oh. <laughs> Seriously, folks, evaluate some things that might be an idol in your life. 
That's really what this is about, right? And you know what? Then deny yourself that thing, okay? You can do the Daniel fast, which is basically just eating fruits and vegetables. There's more on that. If you want to look up DanielFast.com, it'll give you great, you know, recipes and things if you want to do that. I'm going to ask the band to come back up here now. I can't say this enough, but God is not a hard taskmaster and does not, like, he, he's just not a hard taskmaster. He wants you to do this fast. He hopes you make the choice to do it. But you have a free will. He wants us to obey him, but you have a free will. God could command us and order us, but he wants us to follow his guidance willingly because there's benefits to that. There's spiritual benefits to this. We choose to fast as a way to draw closer to the Lord and exercise self-discipline and self-denial to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And during this prayer and fast, I want to encourage us to all participate in intercessory prayer here at Freedom Destiny, right? Now, you've probably heard this now and then, and Deb Miller's, there she is, okay? Deb Miller leads our Freedom Destiny intercessory prayer team, okay? Now, during this prayer and fasting time, since you can't, you might not want to be eating before church, you could come at nine, between 9 and 9 a.m. and about 10.20. They meet in this room back there. And listen, if there's so many of you that we can't fit in there, we'll find another room. Don't worry about that. Don't use that as an excuse. Please don't use an excuse why I don't get here at 9 o'clock. That's okay. Come at 9.30, 9.45. I don't care, 10 o'clock. Come in there for a while. Okay? That's on Sundays. Then on Wednesdays, they, get, they go from about 6 p.m., Till around 6.50 again. We try to end about 10 minutes before the service starts. But you can come then as well. And also, as an added bonus, you might not have known this, on Thursdays, Deb comes over here at 9 a.m. And some, a few people come with her once in a while, or she comes faithfully by herself, and they come in the sanctuary. That's available. Listen, if you want to come over other times that the office is open during this 21-day prayer and fasting time, I'm not going to have a problem opening this church up so you can come in here and pray. Okay? Mm. See, many of us know of times in our past where we did lots of things, but nothing changed. Right? Well, here's the deal. You cannot fast and pray and remain the same. You can't. So let's commit this new year by honoring God first in our lives as we begin this evening at sunset our prayer and fasting time for the next 21 days as a corporate body. Now listen, you can do fasting whenever. Some of you may have been already fasting. Praise the Lord. It's part of your lifestyle. It's part of mine and Candace's. I know many of you have, have made prayer and fasting a part of your lifestyle. But I think as a body, we're coming together at these times, and this is one of them, when we're doing it for these three weeks, and we're going to do this. And at the end of it, we culminate by bringing an offering, and we have a great feast. But don't miss this opportunity to do this as a body. Now, for those of you here that, well, maybe, maybe you're like, this is really kind of sounding interesting, sounding like a, you like a challenge. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe some of you are got a little dry with your time with the Lord and just want to rededicate yourself. Maybe you're out there and you've never, ever received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible's real clear on this. It says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, I will never leave you and forsake you. It's Romans 10, 9 and 10. Maybe you're here and you've had a, like I said, a dry time or you want to recommit. God never left you. It's just you left God, and he's standing by waiting for you to return. Rededicate yourself. We partake in communion. It's in the back where the lamps are back there. And we do that this way because as a body, as a church body, we do it every Sunday. And I encourage you to do it as an individual or as a family. And we do this because simply because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Partake in these elements that represent my body and blood. Do this in remembrance of me. The altar team will be up here. If you need prayer, 
please, folks, don't hesitate to embrace the start of this calendar year by putting God first and have a fresh start. Come to your feet as the band leads us in continued praise and worship. Amen.